going to record as well. Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for joining this new uh, session of our uh, seminar series. Today, we, uh, I'm really happy to, to introduce our, our speaker, which is um, Dr. Margaret Byron. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor at uh, Penn State University, directing the Environmental Biological uh, Film Mechanical Laboratory. Uh, she studied very, very good university like Princeton University, and then moved to, to California Berkeley and also uh, spent some time as postdoc in uh, California Arpine. Um, Margaret uh, research basically focused on uh, how animals control their position and orientation in turbulence, but also interaction between organisms and particles in environmental flows. And so for this kind of research, she got significant awards. Uh, other topics of her research are also um, effects of particle properties on uh, the kinematics uh, 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 in environmental flows, uh, for example, for the study of behavior of microplastic in turbulence. Um, before leaving the floor to, to Margaret, I would like to remind that uh, question time will be after the talk. Um, so if you have any question about uh, uh, about uh, Margaret talk, of course you can write down in the chat or just turn on your microphone and ask your question. So today's talk, as you can read in the title, is about uh, swimming uh, using flexible propulsor at the intermediate scale. So Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giovanni, for the kind introduction. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Margaret Byron. I'm an assistant professor at, at Penn State University in the mechanical engineering department. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of our recent work on uh, biolocomotion and the fluid dynamics of swimming um, and a couple of kind of niches that we're interested within that broad topic. Um, one is flexibility um, and one is this idea of looking at the intermediate scales. And so I want to talk a little bit more first about, about what that means. So when we think about locomotion um, and how you interact with your environment, um, one way to look at that is in relationship to the scales inherent in that environment. So you can see on the left, um, you have this Boston Dynamics Atlas robot uh, and it's traversing a, a rough substrate, right? But if you think about it, the roughness of a substrate is, is really dependent on what size you are. Um, and so if you look down at the floor underneath you, maybe you have some carpet there, it probably feels very smooth to you, but it wouldn't feel smooth if you were an ant or a flea or something like that. Um, and so this, uh, this cockroach uh, on the right here is actually running through a field of obstacles that are about three times its hip height. Um, and even that produced no significant changes in uh, observed neural feedback during rapid running. Um, and so the animal kingdom has some really uh, nice ways of dealing with um, this kind of difference in scale. Uh, and one thing as a fluid mechanicist that I think about when I think of scales is turbulence, right? Turbulence uh, is a collection of scales. You have flow structures, eddies, vortices across a huge range of, of length scales. Um, here on the left is the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and you can see very clearly big puffs, little puffs, medium puffs, all overlaid on top of one another. Uh, and so I think this is a really interesting premise when we think about animal locomotion through this kind of environment, because in the last slide, we had spatial complexity, but here we have temporal complexity as well. Um, so just a quick example here, um, uh, this is uh, hopefully going to play. A colleague of mine, Mark Badger, for his PhD work, looked at how hummingbirds navigate through turbulent gusts. Um, and you can see that it's, it's, it's a pretty big perturbation, uh, but the animal is able to recover from that kind of amazingly. Uh, and so this kind of spatiotemporal complexity is pretty characteristics of animals that swim and fly through fluid environments. And so here I've got kind of a cartoon of your classic uh, energy spectrum in a turbulent flow, right? So on the, on the x-axis is the wave number inverse of wavelength. So big scales on the left and small scales on the right. Um, and I guess you can see my pointer over here, right? Can we see my pointer okay? Yes, okay, awesome. All right, so we have um, big scales and small scales and on the y-axis is the energy that's contained within those scales. Uh, so in the ocean, for example, you would have energy being injected on the scale of the wind and the tides. Uh, and then that energy would transfer down to smaller and smaller and smaller scales 
um, until we get to the range of scales that's small enough for viscosity to become important with respect to inertia, right? Big scales are much more inertial uh, and energy dissipation is minimal uh, compared to the inertia. And, and down here, we have this balance where we see viscous dissipation into heat. Um, and so if you think about animals, right? They obviously exist throughout this range. Uh, you have animals that are bigger than the biggest scales or as big as the biggest scales. And for those animals, the turbulence around them is not going to impact their locomotion so much. It might show up as enhanced mixing. It might impact how they feed or how they behave, uh, but it's not going to impact the control of their position and orientation so much as it would impact uh, animals at these very, very small scales, right? So down here, you have animals that have they're not exactly passive tracers. Many of them have the ability to move around within the flow a little bit, uh, but they're going to be strongly impacted by that turbulence. Um, and to me, I think one of the most interesting uh, characteristics of this map, this stylized map of turbulence, is that there's whole, this whole middle range where if you exist within that middle range of scales, you're regularly experiencing flow structures that are both larger and smaller. Than yourself. And so that would seem to imply that your control of where you are and what you're doing is can be intermittent, right? One moment you might be uh, going along smoothly and the other uh, moment you might be hit with some kind of gust uh, or, or eddy that, that knocks you away from your controlled position. And so I'm interested in kind of what we can learn from animals within this uh, range, especially because our capacity for building engineered devices and get, is getting closer and closer and closer to this range, right? We're miniaturizing our sensors, we're growing the power density of batteries. We might be able to build, uh, you know, underwater vehicles or devices that are operating kind of within this range. And in fact, we, we really already are, right? So we have lots and lots of good examples of bio-inspired robotics. We're trying to learn as much as you can uh, from these principles. Um, and I'd say principles on purpose, right? Because I want us to think about more than just duplicating some organism's body plan, right? I think um, as an engineer, I tend to think in terms of optimization and okay, what are we, what are we doing to, to maximize performance um, characteristics? But organisms don't tend to work that way. That's not how evolution works. Evolution is not an optimizer, right? So if we want to copy the design of, of a, uh, a fish because it swims fast, that's great, but we should figure out why it swims fast and not just build a fish robot because fish swim fast, because this particular fish swims fast, right? Because this particular fish also has to escape from predators or um, you know, eliminate wastes, find food. And unless your robot has to do that, you're kind of copying over a suite of behaviors that, that may or may not be relevant to your desired performance goals, right? So, so I'm interested in discovering kind of the underlying principles that make animals good at swimming or maneuvering or any other kind of, uh, of performance characteristic. Um, and then one last kind of note about this idea of scale dependence is that a relative scale can strongly influence your swimming strategy. So this is my absolute favorite video and I try to put it into every talk I do. Um, and you can see the big fish that are swimming uh, fine. They're, they're moving around, uh, but there's this flow structure, mm -hmm. this vortex in the center, uh, and there's some smaller fish that are in uh, perhaps a lot of trouble. Uh, and, you know, because of their scale, right? They're not able to, to uh, escape from this, uh, this vortex. Um, and so this idea of scale dependence becomes very relevant, especially in a fluid environment. Um, and the second theme that I, I want to think about is this idea of flexibility. Right? So we see a lot of um, flexibility in the biological world, um, and this is in contrast to our kind of historical development of robots and devices have tended to be rigid. Now we're, we're of course starting to see some huge advances in that. We've got all kinds of soft robotic technology these days, uh, and we're starting to see that being implemented. Um, but this idea of flexibility can be kind of key uh, in thinking about the forces that are generated by um, uh, by these, these animals. Um, and so we're also starting to see the technology for us to be able to examine uh, this in a more detailed way. Um, this is actually, now this paper is 10 years old, right? Looking at volumetric imaging of fish locomotion. So we wanna know how the vortices generated by different flexible fins interact in three dimensions to create thrust and help the animal control its position and orientation. Um, and it's not just in the interaction with the environment that these scales matter. Uh, even if the animal is interacting with a completely still fluid, 
there are some key differences between terrestrial locomotion and aquatic and to some degree aerial locomotion. Um, so when we think about walking, you know, walking and running, of course, might look different or be executed differently across physiology, across these scales, but from very, very small animals to very, very large animals, walkers and runners are leveraging the same physics across all scales, right? They have to generate ground reaction forces, right? To propel themselves um, over, the, over the ground. Um, but because of the influence of viscosity versus the influence of inertia, we have a kind of a, a characteristic difference in strategy from small scales to large scales when we think about fluid flow, right? Um, again, one of my favorite examples of this um, is a study um, by China Holtzman that looked at uh, fish larvae. And, and fish uh, often employ a strategy called suction feeding to, uh, to ingest their food. They, they open their mouths and create negative pressure inside the buccal cavity, right, which creates suction, right? So you have this flow um, that comes in and prey comes in with it. Uh, and if we think about uh, an animal that is operating where inertia is dominant at some larger scale, that works fine. But if you're, if you're operating at a very small scale, what happens when you open your mouth and then close it again, that flow is reversible, right? So if you open your mouth and you suck in fluid, that's great. But then you close your mouth and the fluid goes right back out again, along with any prey items you might've wanted to ingest. Um, so that can be uh, a, a huge problem. And in fact, in this paper, they introduced a mechanism, which I think they call hydrodynamic starvation uh, and used it to try to explain the high mortality rate of fish from the larval stage to the adult stage. So this idea of scale dependence shows up in a lot of places that have biological relevance um, in addition to, uh, you know, kind of engineering and, and physics relevance. Um, and we see, of course, a lot of different swimming strategies between these very small scales and between these very large scales. Um, you might have lift-based propulsion, right, with uh, this, you know, manta ray here, um, which I have on the screen. Um, and then you have this very friction viscous dominated modes of propulsion, and these can be very varied um, at those very small scales. Um, and again, I, I want to emphasize that one key limitation is that at this very low um, Reynolds number, we'll talk about that in a second, that the, the flow is time reversible. Um, and that ends up making a huge difference to the strategies that you might want to use to move around. Uh, so one question then is, if you're in this kind of intermediate space, what are the constraints on you, right? So at a very low Reynolds number, you're constrained by viscosity. At a very high Reynolds number, viscosity is perhaps less important. But if you're in this intermediate range, you have uh, a lot of the simplifying assumptions can't be applied. Um, and so I'm assuming that this audience might be familiar with the concept of the Reynolds number, but for those that aren't, um, I have it up here. Uh, we have the Reynolds number represents the, the ratio of inertial forces and viscous forces in a given flow. Um, and so if we have a, a very, very large scale or a very fast flow, you're gonna have a high Reynolds number, very viscous flows, very slow, very small, right? You're gonna see a lower Reynolds number. Um, and so a classic low Reynolds number propulsor which we're gonna look at in more detail today, is the cilium. Uh, and here I have on the left, uh, a paramecium, and uh, it's swimming with uh, some cilia that are on the order of 10 microns long. And that's the typical order of magnitude from about one to 10 microns that you would see um, in the, the ciliated tissue in your, uh, in your uh, cells um, or, or in a microorganism. Um, but the neat thing about cilia is that they, they actually do exist at much, much larger scales. Um, and so on the right, I have uh, an organism called a tenophore or a cone jelly. Um, and these are the largest cilia and the largest animals that use cilia for swimming in the animal kingdom. Uh, and uh, those cilia are about a micron uh, and their Reynolds number, or sorry, excuse me, about um, a millimeter. Uh, and their Reynolds number is correspondingly higher. Um, so let's take a look at cilia, just kind of a basic overview in case you've forgotten your high school biology classes. Uh, but if we have a cilium, right, if it's moving at a very low Reynolds number, this idea of time reversibility becomes really important, right? So if I move a cilium like this and then like this, there will be no net displacement of fluid. I have to move that cilium asymmetrically, right? I have a power stroke and then a recovery stroke that is, that is asymmetric in space, okay? Um, and you can see this um, in these, uh, these little cartoons here. 
who have a power stroke and a recovery stroke, they have a kind of a different cross-sectional area with respect to the flow. Um, but we only see spatial asymmetry here. Um, and we could also think about time asymmetry, right? We have uh, a, a stroke that's spatially and temporally symmetric, right? Just back and forth, tick tock, tick tock, right? At a low Reynolds number, that does nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. Um, and if we make that faster, right? So that the power stroke occurs all over a shorter time scale than the recovery stroke, that's still not going to do anything in this regime of very low Reynolds number Stokes flow. We're going to have, even if the power, the power stroke is much, much faster than the recovery stroke, there will be no net fluid displacement unless you have spatial asymmetry, right? So what we could do there is we could say, this is spatially asymmetric. We can add some temporal asymmetry at a low Reynolds number. It's not going to do anything, but at a higher Reynolds number, we might want to pursue both spatial and temporal asymmetry to enhance the fluid that's being displaced by the cilium. So coming back to tenophores for a second, like I said, these are the largest animals in the world that use cilia for their locomotion. Um, and they're much larger than, uh, lar larger Reynolds numbers than you would see on an organism like a paramecium. Um, and so the cilia-based Reynolds number here is on the order of one, right, give or take. Um, and the, the Reynolds number of the body would be on the order of you know, 100 to 1,000. Um, and uh, the cilia beat in coordinated waves, right? So you have a phase lag between adjacent cilia. They're organized in rows. Each teen of four um, has eight rows of teens, which are kind of uh, paddle-like assemblages of cilia. And the teens beat in sequence to form this metachronal wave. Um, and uh, teen of fours are a variety of body shapes, usually kind of spheroidal, um, but we have other shapes as well, but they always have these eight rows of teens, right? So I'll see if I can play that again. You can see this metachronal wave taking place. Um, and if we zoom out, you know, you have this kind of very primal propulsion system, but it can lead to surprising maneuverability. So here's a Tina 4. Uh, this particular species is an ambush predator. It has big sticky tentacles that it leaves outstretched until it catches prey. Uh, and then it can just kind of motor out wherever it wants to go. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about Tina Four's maneuverability and how this kind of um, propulsion system can contribute to that. So let's take a deep dive. Um, and I wanna kind of really unpack this idea of spatiotemporal asymmetry. And a lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today uh, is the work of my PhD student, Adrian Herrera. Uh, and so credit where credit is due. This is, this is really his work and, and not mine. Uh, or, or mine to tweak here and there and, and his to really kind of dig into. Um, and so we, uh, we were looking at this beating cilia, uh, this beating team, right? This kind of paddle that's flexible um, and say, well, we can quantify the spatial asymmetry and the temporal asymmetry of the strokes. And, and this is not a fixed uh, parameter, right? These can vary between animals, um, even between um, you know, different uh, video sequences of the same animal, we can see different spatial and temporal asymmetries. We decided to define spatial asymmetry in a little bit of a complex way. Um, but uh, if we consider a paddle that has some length L, right, and it's rigid, it can sweep out a half circle of radius L, right? Uh, but our paddle is not rigid, it's flexible. So we figure, okay, well, the, the maximum area that the tip of that paddle could sweep out is roughly an ellipse that's inscribed within that circle. Um, and so we compare that the actual area that the tip of the teen uh, traces out um, and divide that by the, the theoretical sort of maximum that the, the tip could trace out um, and use that to quantify spatial asymmetry, right? So the closer this parameter gets to one, the more spatially asymmetric the stroke is. So higher SA, higher asymmetry, lower SA, right? This would approach zero uh, for a completely symmetric stroke where that AE was about zero, right? So low spatial asymmetry means we have a symmetric stroke. Okay, we can also think about temporal asymmetry. And here we just track the tip of the team as it moves through one beat cycle. Uh, that usually looks like this. You have a peak at the power, uh, uh, power stroke in the middle of the power stroke, and then you have this recovery stroke. Um, and we can look at the difference between the power and the recovery stroke. Um, and uh, we actually um, defined this uh, as um, this expression over here. Um, and so we have a higher value of TA gives us a more asymmetric stroke 
uh, and a lower value gives us a um, less symmetric stroke, uh, more, more symmetric stroke. So TA higher, more asymmetric, TA lower, less symmetric, excuse me. And so we're interested in, okay, across Reynolds numbers, how, how does spatial temporal asymmetry vary in, in the natural system that we're, we're using as a model? And also what might be a good strategy, right? To, to combine these two kinds of asymmetry if you wanna maximize certain performance parameters, right? So to do this, first, we, we actually collected some data um, from uh, tinafores that we collected in the wild um, at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. Um, I know, tough life. Um, but uh, so we, we went over to the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, collaborating with um, Amy Moss at BIOS um, and David Murphy at the University of South Florida. Uh, and we were able to collect um, quite a lot of, of uh, data of the flows generated by these teams, right? So here's an animal um, that we collected um, uh, and we, we really went snorkeling and, and, and tried to find them uh, and hand collected them with jars. Um, and the other uh, place we went to try to get a little bit more data um, from a little bit more of a controlled setting was the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we worked with their team of aquarists, which, you know, some, some really world leaders in jelly, husbandry, jellyfish um, and uh, tinafores, which are jellies, but not jellyfish, uh, the different phylum. So we've got uh, all these wonderful collaborators that helped us collect these data. And the setup looked kind of like this. I've got a kind of a video walkthrough. Um, we're backlighting the vessel containing the teen, uh, the tinafore, which is either pinned or, or restrained somehow to avoid wall effects. We're imaging it with this um, long working distance microscope objective and a high-speed camera. The high-speed camera is parked back in the objective a little bit to get rid of some vignetting around the corners uh, and improve the magnification and, and clarity of the image. Um, and then of course we can take a look at the uh, images that are provided um, and, uh, and see the teens beating. Um, this is actually not a great data set because you can see that the, the teen row is not orthogonal to the plane of vision or the field of view there. Uh, but uh, we worked pretty hard to get a lot of video sequences where the teens were uh, normal to the plane of, of uh, focus so that we could get some good flow fields there. So um, here's a little bit more of a schematic of the setup, right? We have a teen, teen of four that's uh, in this filming vessel um, and we can um, use a technique called particle shadow velocimetry. Some of you might be familiar with particle image velocimetry as a, as a flow visualization technique. We measure the velocities of tracer particles and use the velocities of those tracers as proxies for the velocity of the fluid itself. Um, here, uh, we distinguish between particle image velocimetry and particle shadow velocimetry because we're not using a laser or another light source um, in a sheet to illuminate uh, the tracers. We're actually using a collimated backlight. Uh, and so our, our depth of field here is limited by the optics of the system and not by the light source itself. Um, so for anybody that wants to talk shop, we can do that uh, a little bit later in the Q&A period. But what we end up with is uh, some vector fields that look like this. Um, and from this, we can actually also quantify the um, spatial temporal asymmetry. We can track the base and tip uh, of each teen um, and, uh, and use that to quantify those um, spatial temporal asymmetry parameters that I defined for you in the previous slides. So here are the results from our experiments, at least for our uh, spatial temporal asymmetry parameters. Um, we have two different data sets here, so that's why you see two different colors. You have um, wild collected animals in blue, and we have these cultured animals from the aquarium in red. Um, there are two different species, but they're uh, in the same genus and they're very, very closely related. So we felt okay putting them on the same graph. Um, and what we see is kind of interesting, uh, which is that our spatial asymmetry seems to decrease as our Reynolds number increases, uh, and our temporal asymmetry increases as Reynolds number increases. So this is kind of interesting um, because at very low Reynolds numbers, you know, kind of theoretically, we would expect temporal asymmetry not to matter very much. Um, and that's indeed what we see at this lower Reynolds number. The animals don't really have a lot of temporal asymmetry and, and it's not changing over the, over the course of uh, this increase in Reynolds number. Um, we also see uh, spatial asymmetry though decreasing, which is also interesting uh, because if your goal is to move fluid, you know, more, more spatial asymmetry would seem to be more better uh, in, in that. So we have some mysteries to unpack here uh, and we'd like to know more about this. 
Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the flow fields um, and uh, give you a little bit of a true confession here is that we just really don't have enough data on this to make significant conclusions. Um, we can make some sort of qualitative um, inferences by looking at these flow fields, but but it's, it's really difficult to position the animals just right so that that um, plane of focus is, is right orthogonal to the row of teens. Um, but uh, we can see um, on, let's see, the left um, is an animal with a slightly lower Reynolds number. Um, and and uh, we can see that the flow is a little bit more unidirectional. And as the Reynolds number increases just a very little bit, you're starting to see some coherent flow structure, right? We've got a, a few things that look like vortices uh, and a little bit more two dimensionality to, to the flow. Um, and we can look at the um, radial and tangential flow fields as well. Um, on the top here, you have this kind of lower Reynolds number here. Um, I'm not sure why it's not on the slide, but I think the Reynolds number over here is about 30 uh, and the Reynolds number based on the teen uh, it, over here is about 60 or 70, right? So not a huge difference, uh, but between these two cases, at least we see a little bit of a shift where we have more radially directed flow um, in the, the higher Reynolds number case. Okay, um, so we wanna know kind of what controls the flow as the Reynolds number increases. Uh, and this is very unsatisfying, but I'm gonna leave the flow fields here for now uh, and come back to the kinematics of the paddling, right? Um, and so we were in the middle of this project, um, actually right when the COVID lockdowns hit. Uh, and so instead of going out to the field and collecting more data, which we had planned to do, we really kind of had to, to focus inward and, and say, well, what can we do um, to, to move this you know, project along and, and gain insight into this problem without access to our labs and without access to our field sites? Uh, and uh, so Adrian, the PhD student who is responsible for most of this work, um, built a reduced order analytical model um, to try to model the effect of a team. Um, and so we said, okay, if we have a spheroid, it's, it's moving through a flow, it's subject to uh, a propulsion force that's moving it this way, it's got a drag force that's opposing its motion, it's got an acceleration reaction force that we have to account for, you know, we can just set that equal to mass times acceleration, the trick is going to be quantifying each force, right, so our drag force um, is, you know, you've got your standard kind of drag formulation here, uh, proportional to the velocity squared, except in this case, we are still at intermediate Reynolds number, right? So our drag coefficient is itself a function of the Reynolds number. And that's what makes this problem not trivial, right? Is that there's a lot of feedback, right? Between uh, the resulting uh, speed of the animal and the forces that are opposing its motion, okay? So, so we have um, uh, luckily great literature on drag coefficients of, of spheroids and other simple regular shapes at intermediate Reynolds number. A lot of this actually comes from the chemical engineering literature, uh, which tends to be very interested in the, the uh, dispersal of powders in air. Uh, and so our Reynolds numbers end up being very similar to those uh, and we can use those drag coefficients. Um, and of course our acceleration reaction force is due to if the animal is accelerating, the, the water in front of it has to also be accelerated. So there's more mass than just the animal's body that needs to be accelerated. Um, and so we have to account for that uh, in this um, acceleration reaction force, which is also called the added mass force. So how do we model the propulsion force? Um, we've got these oscillating flexible uh, paddles and we've got a lot of them. Um, so we need to, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so my, PowerPoint has frozen. And so I was just so excited. I'm gonna to try to restart it real quick and see what I can get. Sorry about that. This is what happened when I tried to test those videos, but at a different place. So I'll get it back. And there we go. No harm, no foul, I hope. No, doesn't seem to like that either. I apologize for these technical difficulties. This was not no worry. happening yesterday. Just take Maybe. your time. Yeah, well, let's just see if I can 
fix this up and maybe give it a little bit less to chew on while we do that. Let's try that. Um, work. No, I don't know. Something about this slide. I think it, it must not like. Perhaps you can just describe yeah. it without full screen yeah, and I then think, just move. Yeah, uh, I think I'll move on. So let me just repeatedly stop the process and then restart it. And we can try without full screen. Yeah, exactly. Mode. That's what I'm going And then go. just move. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Giovanni. So um, I don't think I'm going to be able to play a lot of these um, our, uh, GIFs, but this one is a video. So if we can see. No, it's that. That's the problem, child. That video. Okay. Now we know the problem. Oh, man. All right. I'm going to have to restart it one more time, and I'm not going to touch anything on that slide. And we're going to skip right past it. Uh, but effectively, what we're doing here is uh, I'm, I'm pulling a little bit of a bait and switch on you because the title of this talk was about flexibility and its role. Um, but we're not going to model this as a flexible structure. We're going to model it as a rigid structure. Uh, but we're going to model it as a rigid structure whose flow normal area is changing with time. So effectively, if we've got a flat plate uh, and it's moving in an oscillatory fashion, right? So the plate is moving um, along this uh, uh, back and forth right here, but the height of the plate above the substrate is changing. Um, and the tip is tracing out an ellipse, just like the tip of our paddle does. Uh, and what we can do then is we can use some established drag coefficients for oscillating plates at flat rel at uh, intermediate Reynolds numbers, right? Because you know we're working at this regime where you know a lot of stuff is empirical, um, and we don't necessarily have great um, governing principles for what's going on. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're saying the drag coefficient, which is a function of the Reynolds number, uh, is changing according to the velocity of the plate, uh, and the cross-sectional area here we've got the the tip position is x a y a uh, so y a is changing over the course of one power stroke and we can set the uh, the speed that the plate proceeds over uh, this top portion of the ellipse which is the power stroke and then the bottom portion of the ellipse the recovery stroke uh, and so we can uh, by that kind of very blunt mechanism look at spatial asymmetry and temporal asymmetry and kind of sever them so that they're independently variable. Um, so that's what we're gonna do here for this model. Um, and I'm gonna see if we can go back here. Okay, so no, no touching the demon slide again, right? But uh, so we can look at a single teen, right? And this is the, the animation here shows you how this model works. And we can take a look at the force that's being produced by this one teen. Right, um, and how that one you know, propulsive force of a single team, a single paddle, uh, changes depending on how we vary the spatial and temporal asymmetry, which we can define according to our definitions from previously. Uh, and so uh, we're going to define this kind of SATA space. So um, depending on the spatial and temporal asymmetry, I can be anywhere in this space and map this propulsive force. We're averaging the propulsive force over one power cycle, which is why it has a bar over it. Um, and I can do this kind of gradient-based analysis, uh, almost a sensitivity analysis, to get an idea of how sensitive this force is to spatial asymmetry or to temporal asymmetry, depending on where I am in SATA space, right? Um, and so, in general, right, so if I, if I define my gradient operator this way, right, if I have the derivative of my force as I move around in the TA axis versus the SA axis, um, the ratio of those two gradients gives me a, a rough sense of how sensitive my force production is to both of these asymmetries. Uh, and if we average this over the entire tested space uh, between a, a very low Reynolds number and a, a relatively higher Reynolds number, which is corresponding to what we see in the animals, we can see that at very low Reynolds numbers, this uh, gradient um, ratio is lower than one, right? Um, indicating that spatial asymmetry is more important, or we're more sensitive to spatial asymmetry than temporal asymmetry, as we expect, right? We can't really go 
uh, down too far because our models are based on intermediate Reynolds numbers. So our models are not going to match very well at, at very low Reynolds numbers. But uh, as we move up, we see a more and more sensitivity to this temporal uh, asymmetry, right, as the Reynolds number increases. Um, and we can look at this um, heat map over here of the propulsive force. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to the slope of the contours, right? So a totally flat slope, right, would mean that we're very, very sensitive to SA and we're not sensitive at all to TA, right, as we move across the contours, right? But as we see those contours shift to more and more vertical, we're seeing an increasing sensitivity to TA, right? We can see that propulsive force increases as SA increases and as TA increases, but it increases more quickly with increasing TA, right? So this is interesting and, and kind of expected. Uh, but we're not just interested in a single teen. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what's going on here. We're going to have to really abandon the idea of uh, using PowerPoint. Oh, my apologies for this. Okay, well, let's just keep it out of full screen mode. So apologies for the technical difficulties. All right. Um, so we want to model the whole row, right? Uh, and we're doing this acknowledging that our model has a lot of limitations, right? We're not modeling the hydrodynamic interaction between our teams. And so it doesn't matter how close together they are or how far apart they are. We're really just summing uh, the force that's being produced by these dephased plates. Um, and that's, of course, not characteristic of the entire uh, system. Um, we know that the phase lag and the spacing are, are two very important parameters and we're only really capturing the phase lag here. But we can model a whole row uh, and take a look at what that does. We can validate it against um, our swimming animals, right? Uh, and we actually do have some video footage of animals zoomed out so that we can look at the swimming trajectories and in the whole body and not just at the level of the teen. Uh, and we can match our uh, model to those swimming speeds. So we can have, um, an animal accelerating from nearly rest in a straight line, right? We can model that with this, uh, this unidirectional model, right? So again, we have this collection of flat plates that are oscillating. Uh, we're adding the forces generated from each of those plates together uh, and using them to try to model uh, a Tina 4 that has eight of these rows. Again, lots of limitations, uh, but still maybe worthwhile, especially given that we can use this model um, with reasonable values of SA and TA. We can't look at a video like this and quantify SA and TA. It's too zoomed out for us to be able to do that with any accuracy. But we can look at the range of SA and TA that we observe across many animals and say, well, this fits within uh, what we know. Um, so let's take a look at the efficiency, right? Because when we have a whole animal, we can look at power and we can look at um, the actual cost of swimming. Um, and so we can see, again, the same kind of heat map uh, in SA and TA space. This is at a specific Reynolds number, but the, the heat map looks very similar for most Reynolds numbers. We have uh, an increase in swimming efficiency with both SA and TA, but again, our efficiency is always more sensitive to temporal asymmetry, TA. So this was a really interesting result. Um, and uh, one thing that we're still kind of in the dark about is the relationship between SA and TA in the animal itself, right? So uh, we don't know enough about the material properties of the teens. Um, we know that the teens, the paddles are not muscularized. Uh, and so there might be some control of the spatial asymmetry along the plate, but it is likely that spatial asymmetry is passive, right? Uh, and so spatial asymmetry and temporal asymmetry are, are not likely to be independent in the animal itself, right? You have this paddle uh, that's waving back and forth, but it's likely that the control is mostly at the base, right? Uh, and so the material properties of the teen are gonna play a huge role uh, in what that spatial asymmetry ends up being at a given oscillation frequency. Uh, and, and we don't actually know whether the animal has the ability to um, proactively stiffen or de-stiffen the paddles in real time to change that asymmetry parameter. Um, so that's something that we're looking into and we're hoping to kind of have some more uh, insight into in the future. Um, but uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit here uh, instead of looking at the, the teens, right, and what we've learned about spatial temporal asymmetry at the scale of the paddle or at the scale of a collection of paddles, we're going to look at the scale of the whole animal. 
right? So we know that tenophores are, are really maneuverable. And it's going to freeze again. Oh my gosh. Um, so if these videos were working, um, what you would see is uh, an animal that is uh, moving uh, very I swear these were working yesterday. Um, uh, an animal that's moving in a straight line, right? So moving right here and then reversing, right? So swimming forwards and then swimming backwards, right? And switching direction in a, in a relatively short time. Um, and here you would see an animal moving uh, into a very sharp turn, right? So the animal would move into a sharp turn uh, and, and would be able to do that while maintaining uh, a pretty significant cruising speed. Uh, so what we did was we took our, um, our setup from our, our experiments in Bermuda. We were also able to collect data of the animals freely swimming uh, in, a, in a glass cuvette um, across a lot of different sizes uh, of, of body. Um, and so we tracked, um, you know, thanks to a lot of great advances in um, 3D kinematic tracking, uh, we were able to do some, some AI powered deep learning style um, markerless tracking. We can track the, um, the stomach and the two tentacular bulbs of the animal. As you can probably imagine, tracking, uh, kinematic tracking of an animal that's transparent uh, can be a little bit challenging. Uh, but we were able to track them and, and get a lot of data on the trajectory. So you can see here, I'm not going to try to play this video lest we crash again, but the, the, the black line represents the approximate trajectory of the center of mass and the colored lines are the three tracked points. Um, and what we found was uh, some really interesting stuff. So even just looking at this kind of idea of forward swimming versus backward swimming, most animals can't swim backward as fast as they can swim forward. Um, but uh, these animals can. And, uh, and they, they actually, if you look over here, all these different animals that are um, quantified in this way, uh, it's, it's one of the best, where the ratio of your average forward swimming speed to your average backward swimming speed uh, is pretty much one. Um, and so that's interesting. And we'd like to know about the physical forces that empower them to do that. And the second thing we observed is that they can make really sharp turns, okay? So of all of the trajectories that we were able to quantify, uh, we plotted the radius of curvature um, divided by the body length and said, well, if it's, if it's turning, we're gonna quantify that as uh, a length specific turning radius of less than one. So it's, it's turning radius is less than its body length. Uh, and so of these turning sequences, we got seven different turning sequences, um, we noticed that it was maintaining a relatively high speed. You can see these animals have, um, are maintaining a speed of almost half a body length per second, uh, which is pretty fast uh, for such a sharp turn. Um, and so uh, again, we can compare this to the literature uh, and say that we're, we're comparable here um, to, uh, you know, depending on your criteria for turning and how sharp that turn has to be, we're going to be a, a little bit comparable to animals like the boxfish, which are very, very um, well known. They're well known to be very, very maneuverable. Um, and so we expanded this kind of analytical model, which again has its limitations, but it's useful as kind of a quick and fast device to sweep through a parameter space very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm not going to try to play these videos, but you would see these again, rows of oscillating plates, this time mapped to the curved body of a spheroidal uh, approximation of a tenophore. So we've got eight rows um, and a number of plates in each row. Uh, and those plates beat at a certain frequency and a certain phase lag, which we can manipulate to try to figure out what's going on. Um, so we, uh, we use this reduced order model um, to quantify uh, turning parameters uh, and turning maneuvers. Uh, and we did this by uh, looking at uh, two different kinds of turns either a turn from rest where the initial velocity was zero and we actuated the two outside rows and the two inside rows at two different frequencies with a variety of delta F. Um, or we had a turn from a starting velocity where we had a V naught that was equal to the steady state swimming velocity that would be achieved by all eight rows having the same beat frequency. Uh, and then all of a sudden at some time t equals zero, we set again the two outer rows uh, and the two inner rows to have a certain delta F delta frequency um, while maintaining the uh, original frequency on all the other four rows. So when we do that, we, we can 
kind of sweep through this parameter space and get a lot of data points for this theoretically achievable turning radius as a function of the body speed or the, the steady state swimming speed. Um, and our experimental data points are shown here in blue, uh, but all of the achievable kind of spaces that our model shows are, are over here where anything less than one, a turning radius, body specific turning radius of less than one is highlighted in red. Uh, and so what this tells us is that uh, it might be possible for us to achieve really small turning radii while maintaining uh, a quite significant cruising speed. We do not have to stop in order to turn tightly. We can keep swimming uh, and, uh, and do that. And so again, these videos would show uh, traced uh, trajectories of, of really kind of maneuverable um, uh, uh, swimming. Uh, and you know, we think that that's gonna be valuable in the future. Um, we know that our bio-inspired designs have tended to focus on, um, I hesitate to say more traditional swimmers, uh, but perhaps uh, less, less unique than this system, right? Which has these eight rows, really robust, right? We can lose a paddle here and there and it's not gonna make much of a difference to the overall uh, capabilities. Um, so we've got this maneuverability question. We know that our model system can swim equally fast forward or backwards and make tight turns without slowing down. Our model kind of helps show what the space might look like. Uh, it doesn't give us any additional insight on the physics of what's going on when these turns are happening. We need some more flow visualization of the animals themselves to make that happen uh, and or some, some real CFD that has the flow structure interaction built in there. Right now we really have this kind of very rudimentary model. Uh, and so we're working on that um, as well. Um, and so I have just a couple more things that I wanted to share to switch gears entirely, um, mostly because uh, I wanna know if any of you guys are interested in the same thing. Um, but uh, when I moved to Pennsylvania a few years ago, I was very disappointed to discover that there was no ocean there. Um, and so uh, we started looking at freshwater animals for inspiration and we found it in, uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates, which are insects that you know live in ponds and streams and things like that. Uh, and so again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this project, but we're effectively really interested in these animals because they are multimodal locomotion experts, right? They are one of, uh, they're a group of these insects and, and they join this kind of small family of animals that can swim and walk and fly with reasonable competence. Um, and so we're really interested in, in looking at the physics of how they locomote across these transitions. Um, and again, there is some role of flexibility here. Um, these animals swim using kind of adapted legs that have hairs on them uh, and the hairs will spread during the power stroke uh, and the recovery stroke comes back. So even though it's a completely different model system, you have a lot of the same problems. This is still an intermediate Reynolds number drag based swimming system, right? Uh, and if I were to play this video, you would see this sequence kind of highlighted here where the paddle uh, turns normal to the flow, uh, normal to the swimming direction, and then comes back, right? So we have shape change, we have cross-sectional area change, uh, and we have uh, some asymmetry in the power and recovery strokes, all while the paddle itself is kind of bending. Um, and these systems we can see are maneuverable as well. Um, they're uh, highly kind of intermediate Reynolds number, you can see this kind of uh, hop and then slowing down and hopping and slowing down. There's not a lot of gliding in the system. There is some, but this speaks to the influence of viscosity on this animal swimming. Um, and I'm gonna skip this part here. Uh, but the coolest thing about these animals, I think, is their transition to flight. Uh, so when they would like to move to a new pond, what they actually do, they have super hydrophobic wings. They don't need any drying time. Uh, they just kind of come up to the surface, um, and I'm not going to play this video, but I do have a film strip of the sequence, right? Uh, and they push down with their legs, and the wings begin to beat almost simultaneously, uh, and we can see that they don't break the surface tension. They have this kind of whoosh takeoff, um, and uh, so we, we are really interested in understanding this system uh, in terms of what is the role of surface tension, what is the role of aerodynamics, uh, and, and how does this kind of take off occur? And of course, that's gonna, again, give us more insight into uh, possible engineered solutions that use these principles, not to blindly copy from the system, but to really understand what is um, giving this animal the ability to transition so easily between locomotor modes. Um, and so I, I wanna leave you with this idea that we have uh, biological propulsion at intermediate Reynolds number is full of interesting problems, 
right? Uh, and I talked about one problem and then very briefly touched on another system, uh, but uh, we've got a lot going on here uh, and I'm really interested in, in unpacking it. Uh, and I'm also interested in unpacking with you. So we're recruiting for both of these projects um, and we're recruiting for uh, PhD students and uh, a postdoc as well. Um, on I, both of the, the Tina Force Wing project and the Insect Flight project. Um, and I would also like to put in a plug for my student who will be graduating next year on, and it is in search of a postdoc. Uh, so if you have any questions about any of that, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, and with that, I'm not gonna try to play this video, but it would show you a cool uh, swimming trajectory of a Tina 4 taken by an underwater vehicle. So I'll leave this one. Uh, I think you can try last slide. Just, can I try it? Just, yeah. Oh, it's working. Oh, there we go. So. Okay. Well, if that's if that's working, then we're gonna try this because this is the coolest video in the whole talk. There we go. Okay. So this is the bug, right? Uh, and he's decided that he wants to go to a new pond, uh, and he's preparing for for takeoff. This is um, highly slowed. I think twenty times slowed. Um, and in a moment, see the wings pop out of the wing case. They're hydrophobic. They don't need to dry. And you see the takeoff right there. Wow. Yeah, so it's a really cool process. Um, there's a roof on the vessel, so he can't get out. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I think this is a, a very cool system that we're really just starting to understand. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sorry for going a little bit over. Thank you very much for this very great talk. I'm really sorry about these IP uh, issues that you had, but- It's, it's it, totally on my end, and yeah, I have no anyway. idea. Some updates <laughs> probably broke something. Yeah, but still amazing. Make a representation and videos and anything that's very good. So, um, any question? I have, a, I have one. Can I go ahead? Hi. Right. Sure. Hey, Margaret. Nice to see you. And nice to see you again. Yeah. Online, unfortunately. Uh, it is what it is. Um, amazing talk. Amazing talk. I was really Thank excited you. about all this. Um, the slide where um, you showed the free body diagram. Mm. And break down, I was wondering. Obviously, it's not as cool and as sophisticated, but you know how you said you took all the existing data on drag mm -hmm. as one of these plugs. Can can we imagine that the in some ways that the drag and the thrust are are implicitly connected to each other, and that you sort of have something like a free slip or a different boundary condition? Mm. On yeah, the sphere? I would see that, what you're saying. Yeah. That, we haven't, we haven't gone into that. I see what you're saying, right? Because you have this oscillating row of paddles and we're assuming that we've got the same drag coefficient as a solid spheroid would have. Yeah. Um, and of course that's not, that's not true. Um, I don't know, a, a semi-slip boundary condition would be an interesting thing. I think we struggled mightily to find even remotely appropriate drag coefficients. We particularly struggled with the viscous torque for yeah. intermediate Reynolds number spheroids. I think we found one, one paper uh, that addressed it, um, but uh, but yeah, I think if you have uh, some data to share, no, I I, I I don't think it's it would improve any of this work because yeah. it's wonderful work. I'm just thinking more holistically. I've used the the Tana four as an example in my biofluids course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's nothing great about system. it, but it's such a cool problem. And then it really is. I was thinking as you're presenting at at an even more crude level, could you just say, well, think of a sphere that behaves differently than a sphere in a normal this with you no know, no slip conditions sure. yeah but obviously that doesn't really you know maybe it's not so cool it's just sort of a silly distraction but i really i really enjoyed the talk and and on, even without the videos working at the end it was still well there. well we'll Great see fact. but yeah this actually this is a perfect opportunity to shout out um, my collaborator chen yu lee who's, who's here um, uh, so Cheng Yu is at, at Villanova working on some parallel CFD simulations of, of the same system, kind of working from the videos that we have. And I know that he has talked about uh, trying to help us out with those empirical um, mm. coefficients. And the issue is that everything's Reynolds number dependent. So you have to have kind of a map of the whole space to be able to draw back on. And it's, it's not a trivial problem. Yeah. Um, but Cheng Yu is doing some really cool stuff. Um, one thing that I didn't get to talk about is that we're interested in the effect of curvature on the produced forces, right? So there's a lot of modeling of ciliary flows um, and it's, a, it's an extremely well-studied problem. Uh, but usually those, those mathematical models assume that the substrate is flat and rigid. But in biological systems, that substrate is usually deformable. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's often curved like it is in this system. So we're really interested in the effects of, of deformability and curvature on of the substrate on the flows that are generated by these flexible biopropulsors. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions? I see a lot of familiar names in the in the participant list that are not just the students that I coerced to be here. So that's really wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to see all of you, even if it's at least um, through a screen. Uh, let me just like um, give some like a uh, comment. Uh, I, I, I don't have like no, no, no like no direct questions. I actually like get a lot of WeChat from like uh, my Chinese friends like say, oh, it's too late. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to look like, you know, for the rest of like the video online. So, and they're probably going to contact you like afterwards. They have okay. a lot of questions yeah. like, but, um, like a couple of comments I have, um, not, uh, like awesome talk, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second of all, is like uh, um, uh, for the for the last project, like uh, um, I don't know whether you know Kevin Kevin Chen, like you know, like um, he's like assistant professor in MIT, graduate graduate with like uh, Robert Woods Lab. Yeah, that doing, sounds really like, familiar. You know, I oh micro. oh, I think actually he might be on this. Where is it? He might be on this paper. Oh no. Maybe, maybe this paper. Did you work on the water strider stuff? I feel like I remember seeing a Chen in the author list of those papers. Maybe that's David David Hu. So, but anyway, no, Kevin was like yeah. doing, doing, doing like this micro like uh, aerial robotics. And right. he actually like have like a shoot of like water cannon to like have like, you know, micro robotics like fly out of water. Okay, and, okay, um, so that's not the problem. He, yeah. he, he gave a talk like, you know, maybe two or three like, you know, uh, session ago mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, seems like you, you may be familiar but like uh, haven't met him like no i can like definitely shoot you guys a mail i think he will particularly interesting in like yeah. you know in the like you know the the shooting like you know the flying out of the water of the like insects yeah. which mm -hmm. he is like a more on the robotic side right. and uh like you know so i think there's like maybe a lot of like uh collaboration between you chen yu and like you know kevin like you know, sure, for, yeah. for, for a lot a lot of things so yeah, I know. I know Rob Woods Group has done quite a lot of the the takeoffs from the service. I think this system is interesting because it brings in the 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 wing beat component, right? So we yes. have some information about how insects push off from a water surface, but yeah. but the idea of the wings beginning to beat while the animal is still on the surface is a really interesting one to me. Yeah. yeah so for, for 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 Calvin, I think like you know he did do a takeoff from water, but he actually using a like you know hydrogen water cannon. So like okay. actually like a jet, like no. That sounds like fun. Uh, <laughs> right, I, I want to, I want to do that. <laughs> That's like an awesome, but uh, uh, I think his talk is also recorded. I will send you that. Like yeah. I also yeah. can send I like a mail to like a YouTube playlist as well. Yeah, yeah. I so and also. Oh, and also, I, I just like uh, so Rebecca, just like one comment before, like uh, so, and also like if you want, like Margaret, Margaret, like you know, so uh, we can also advertise your like you know your your like you know recruitment. Yeah. Yes, so that would be great. Our this mailing like list really has like, thousand people, mm -hmm. so ish, like you know, even through mechanics. So mm -hmm. like you know, maybe there'll be people passionate to work with you. So yes, well, I would I would love to hear from anybody that that's interested in in helping. Um, explore these things. So, yeah, question yeah. from Rebecca. Yeah. Yep. Hello, thank you Hi. for your talk. It's really great to see you again. Hello. Oh, I wasn't sure if you'd remember. Oh, no, I haven't heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Been a meeting, March it's been, meeting. It's been, been a while though, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you know anything about um, when the Tina Fours are like changing direction or um, uh, or swimming backwards, whether the teen like beat pattern does it just like straight up reverse when it's going backwards? Um, is there any like uh, preferred direction of beating? Because it, presumably it knows which way is forward. So it knows when- Yes and yes. Uh, yeah, so so it does it does change the direction of beating. Um, and so there's a whole, you know, gamut of papers from the biology side, um, which I can send to you if you're interested, um, but uh, looking at this um, beating reversal. So the, the power stroke, switches with the recovery stroke and they just change, change direction. But what's interesting yeah. is 
the direction of the wave of the beat propagation is typically opposite to the direction of the power stroke. Yeah. So we, we can have either symplectic metacrine yeah. or antiplectic metacrine. I know because you study cilia, you, you know, yes. but, um, but yeah, so, so the direction of the wave propagation um, is typically opposite. And I, I don't know, actually, I'd have to ask Adrian, my, my student, if we see in our data, we do see um, teen beat reversal, but I can't remember if we've, we've seen a switch to antiplectic or symplectic um, metachrony. Uh, and so I don't yeah, know. Our, really data interesting. our data set is pretty limited. We're hoping to get back out in the field this summer. And, and also, so when it actually does the reverse, is the, is the shape exactly the same? Does it have the same values of SA and TA when it's doing its backwards beating as the forwards beating? Is it like a, wow. a straight off flip or does That's it? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that in part because of technical limitations, because when we take the videos of the zoomed out animals, we, we don't have enough resolution to really get the spatial asymmetry. But if, we, if we're not allowing the animals to freely swim, Right. If we're zooming in on the teens, we, we typically have to tether them so that they're not yeah. swimming. Um, and so we don't. Uh, you can't get them to reverse when they're tethered. Well, right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that's a really yeah. interesting question. I've, I've, I've had heard. similar problems. Yeah. Yeah. You can't so, image it unless it's staying still. But if it's staying still, it's not really swimming, is it? So. Yeah. Well, for our next data campaign, we're hoping to have access to some significantly higher resolution cameras. So we might be able to get that dynamic range of, of the body scale to the teen scale, hopefully a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you. Great questions. Thanks. Another one. Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hey, Margaret. Thank you for this uh, uh, awesome talk. Um, so I just have a question uh, that I've seen some videos uh, how this uh, feather starts swimming. So yes. they are kind of like uh, sea stars uh, and uh, they do very similar motion, but uh, for, for how I see their legs moving, actually there is uh, something of a phase difference between yes. those, uh, those uh, legs. So do you think uh, this uh, phasing uh, has an importance and also maybe can be can be also used for uh, future underwater vehicles. Yeah, so I think that phase lag is definitely an important parameter. I know what you're talking about, the crinoids, the feather stars. Um, I actually poked around to try to see if anybody was looking at the, the fluid dynamics of those, and apparently they're very fragile and very difficult to bring up. Um, so we're going to have to turn to, to maybe some, some people. Um, I know Kakana Khatija over at Ambari has been doing underwater velocity of these really fragile, difficult to study creatures um, to explore things like the effect of phase lag. Um, and for those that, that have not seen this, I highly recommend looking up feather stars. They're these crazy sea star looking things with long fringy arms and they, they move all around. Um, I'm going to stop before I lose any more dignity. Uh, but uh, the phasing is, is, is clear that there's a regular phase lag in the, in the arms. And so this is a system where you have um, eight different rows uh, that are not, they're not actually independent. We know that there can be different frequencies on each row, but they're kind of centrally controlled. Um, so they're, there's not an infinite level of independence between them. Um, but I think that that could be a key to thinking about bio-inspired technology you know, previously a lot of a lot of the control surfaces in, in these kinds of systems have been based around you know models of animals with fins, maybe five, seven, nine fins, but but now we have all these tiny independent paddles. Maybe that will help us kind of make improvements. And we're trying to think about um, what that would imply for efficiency and cost of transport and things like that, as opposed to these other systems um, that are, I guess, you could you could say fin based versus paddle or appendage-based, multi-appendage systems. That was a roundabout answer to your question. Did I get it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, it seems there are no more questions. If so, I have a quick one. Sure. Uh, just to conclude, uh, when, when you shown the, the, the plot for asymmetry, their spatial or temporal symmetry, um, are these uh, computed from only one uh, of these uh, flexible uh, elements, uh, this flagella, or you have considered more the one like an average? Because yeah, so my, my intuition is that perhaps this, yeah, these elements uh, in different position in the body maybe right. could have different behavior, either in time or perhaps yeah. in space. But so, so we actually, I'm gonna go to some of my, my backup slides here. Yeah. Um, is, is the, you have to remember that this model is so simple 
right? Yeah. It's, it's almost laughably simple. And I'm surprised that it showed us as much as it did or matched the animal swimming as well as it did. So we, we did both approaches. We looked at a single paddle um, and okay. then we looked at multiple paddles in a row, but because okay. there's no hydrodynamic interaction between the paddles, we're really losing, you know, the only effect of okay. phase lag here is to kind of make the, the propulsive force smoother, right? So you can see here on the right, um, a, an animal yeah. with zero phase lag where all the paddles in the row are beating has really jerky swimming, right? And so by adding a phase lag, you can smooth out the swimming because when this paddle's in its recovery stroke, then the one a few paddles down is in its power. Yeah, stroke. yeah. Um, and what was interesting about that is that we looked at the, the phase lag that gave us kind of the optimal smoothness overlapped really well with some other work from people studying um, other metachronal systems. So I'm thinking of Arvind and Krishnan at Oklahoma State uh, who studies krill, right? Um, not, not a biologically similar system, but physically they still use this kind of phase lag paddle in the legs to swim. Okay. And, and he found this kind of optimal efficiency phase lag. Um, and I think David Murphy in his papers also found kind of like okay. an 18 to 25% ish phase lag. Um, was optimally efficient. So we thought it was really interesting that what our model showed is the smoothest swimming trajectory overlapped with the most efficient trajectories that had been found by big people with a little bit more sophisticated modeling um, and actual robotic platforms that they were kind of using to test the similar question. Um, but yeah, I think here we really have to move up to a model where hydrodynamic interactions are being considered because I think that that's really where the phase lag is going to show up as important. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, thinks there are no more questions. Yeah, yeah, so, yes, oh, yeah. Sorry. yeah, very okay. amazing talk, Margaret. Yeah, just actually, I'm trying to add one more comment. Follow Tia's comments about the uh, like the uh, breaking the surface tension. I think it's a very interesting topic, and uh, um, and also uh, because another researcher gave a a, a talk as as Tisha mentioned, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Chen from MIT. Actually, they design a robot and trying to break this, uh, break down the surface tension and, and uh, switch from swimming to flying. But they using very complex strategy, and uh, typically the robot, uh, the robot need to wait maybe uh, twenty seconds or even longer time so that they can uh, remove the water. Mm -hmm. from the whole robot and then they can uh, uh, switch to flying motion. I think this strategy from nature will be very interesting and uh, can provide a lot of you know inspiration for the robotic scientist. Because I just have one quick question about when the uh, when this uh, insect break the surface tension, um, is that possible for, for them to like walking on the surface right for this uh, specific insects or they cannot walk on the surface but just uh, jumping out of the water and the breaking down the surface tension. So they sort of row on the surface. They don't walk and you can see the front uh -huh. legs. I think actually these are the middle legs are, are under the water. Yeah. Um, and so the body is above the water and the hind legs, which are the big paddles are above the water, but you see that some of the legs are down, down under. So I think one thing that's interesting about these guys is that they're right on the border of being able to do what they're doing, which to mm -hmm. me says that there's gotta be something some kind of inter interesting interaction at okay. play because um, they're a lot bigger and I think a little bit heavier and kind of more bulky mm -hmm. than something like a water strider, which has these very narrow spindly legs that elevated off the surface. Here, there's much more um, surface area in contact, right? The, the shape of the, the appendages that's touching the water is different. Um, and so I'm wondering kind of what we can learn from this system as opposed to some of the better studied systems out there. Yeah, very interesting mechanism. Thank yeah. you for sharing this amazing video, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think this concludes our talk today. So I'd like to thank again, Dr. Margaret Byron for this really amazing talk. And I would like to invite you to your, our next uh, appointment uh, next week uh, with our seminar series. So have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, everybody. It's great to be here. Bye. See thank you, Margaret. Bye. Thank you.